Hey kids, today I've got another character study for you all, a man known as Zhang Zengshan. In 1881, he was born into poverty in the Shandong region of China. His father was a head shaver, not a barber mind you, if a head shaver is a barber then a ditch shaver is an architect. He also moonlit as an alcoholic. His mom, meanwhile, was a literal practicing witch and exorcist, already a recipe for success. Zhang joined a group of roving bandits at age 20, as one does, right around the Xinhai Revolution, where the Qing Dynasty was overthrown and the Republic of China was established. But in 1916, the kidneys of the nation widely disliked monarchist leader Dun Shat the Bed, causing a power vacuum that ultimately led to what is known as the Warlord Era of the Republic. During this time, different regions of China were constantly shifting hands between a collection of separate military groups, all of whom were ruthless both to each other and to the people they ruled over. And through charisma, favors to the right people, and a keen sense of military pragmatism, our humble highwaymen soon came to be one of these warlords. Now Zhang was quite skilled as a leader of war. After the Russian Civil War, he recruited thousands of fleeing white Russians, not beverages, but Bolshevik books which bolstered his battalions and brought big bonuses to his bloodshed. He also made efficient use of armored trains, which proved to be highly cost-effective at transporting large amounts of troops and supplies. But that's not what you people care about, you want some clownage. Well, rest assured, Zhang was quite the character. Now, we all know the age-old debate between positive and negative reinforcement. On the one hand, if you treat people well, you'll probably get the same treatment back later down the line. But on the other hand, nobody's ever taught a tiger to jump through flaming hoops with just pets and temptations. And if you think that's messed up, that's because, well, yeah, it is. Circuses are fucking evil. But like all great leaders, Zhang knew how to appropriately apply both the carrot and the stick. As an example of the former, he defeated the forces of enemy general Wu Peifu largely by convincing members of his army to defect, with the promise that they could keep their original rank after switching sides, which he fulfilled. But then he was like, yeah, I don't know if my loyal men would be too happy about being outranked by strangers. Well, only one solution here. All my guys are ranking up. Problem was, so many officers were promoted that Zhang literally ran out of gold and silver to make new insignias. He was like, ah, I gotta think about this. Went out for a smoke, looked down, Hey, wait a minute, and had the rest of the emblems made out of the colorful foil found in cigarette packages. It's said that during the promotion ceremony, people would look down and notice their little star already had a rip in it before the event was even over. But hey, there's still a colonel or poobah or whatever now, they can't complain. On another occasion, he proudly announced that he would either win an upcoming battle or return home in his coffin. And though Zhang was many things, he was not a liar. So after he ended up retreating, his men paraded him through the streets in a casket while he waved and sheafed on a cigar. So you're probably wondering why they called him the dogmeat general. At this point, my head was swimming with lurid fantasies about him eating dog flesh, or wearing dog flesh, or eating dog flesh. Turns out, nah, he was just real into pie gal, of which the act of playing was colloquially referred to as eating dog meat and also because he ate dogs. He was also sometimes jokingly referred to as the three don't knows, since he didn't know how much money he had, how many concubines he had, or how many men were in his army. Well, funny, there was some truth to the nickname, which did sometimes cause issues. Some were minor. For one, he had a lot of trouble remembering the names of the 30 to 50 women of all nationalities in his harem, but he got around this by just assigning them numbers. Number four is real flexible, 27 makes a killer quiche, watch out for 14, she's a biter, and so forth. Other times, things got a little more dire. Later in his career, Zhang became became the military governor of the province of Shandong. And while the warlord life suited him, domestic affairs were another story. Rampant human rights violations aside, the whole thing was just way poorly managed. For example, while Zhang did collect taxes on everything from theater performances to tobacco examination licenses, relatively little of his extortions went towards his war efforts or anything practical, with most of it being funneled into vanity projects and his own personal riches. So how did he fund his army? Well, for those playing at home, it's time to take a shot. Cause Zhang printed tens of millions of dollars worth of paper money in the form of military stamps with no reserve to back them up. Obviously, massive inflation ensued, but Zhang just said, no, -uh. insisted the stamps had a one-to-one -one conversion with real money and continued paying his men at the same rate. Fortunately for them, the invisible hand of the market is no match for the very visible fist of the soldier, because they just kick old merchant ladies' asses till they accepted the currency at face value. But unfortunately, kicking old ladies' asses can't solve everything. In the summer of 1927, Shandong was hit with a famine caused primarily by drought. At the time, many people prayed to Zhang Xian, a folk deity, in an attempt to bring rain to these crusty lands. But Zhang Zengshang, he don't get on his knees for nobody. He walked right up to the statue in Xian's temple, starts bitch slapping it, tells it to go fornicate with its sister, and then has his artillery crew fire shells straight into the sky for hours on end to show that god who he's dealing with. Sources differ on when the next rain was, but it did eventually rain, so in the end, Zengshang got the last laugh. Speaking of which, our boy was also a renowned poet. Here's a piece he wrote about that very event. <clears throat> the sky god is also named Zhang. Why does he make life hard for me? If it doesn't rain in three days, I'll demolish your temple, then I'll have cannons bombard your mom. Truly prophetic. He's got a few other good ones too, let me just dim the lights real quick, yeah. This one's called Visiting Mount Tai. 
From afar, Mount Tai looks blackish, narrow on top and wide at the bottom. If you flipped it upside down, it would be narrow at the bottom and wide on top. I like that one a lot, because it's like he heard about metaphors without realizing they're supposed to have a second meaning. This one's titled, Poem About Bastards. You tell me to do this, he tells me to do that. You are all bastards, go fuck your mother. Poignant. But unlike most poets besides E.E. E. Cummings and Emily Dickinson, Zhang was quite well endowed. He was often referred to as General 86, as when Zhang Jr. stood up straight, he could reportedly reach the length of 86 Mexican silver dollars stacked atop one another. Given a thickness of 2.4 millimeters, this would put him at around 20.6 centimeters or 8.1 inches. That's especially impressive given that he was likely malnourished during puberty due to both poverty and the 1896 famine. You racist. I thought of a few other jokes about this, but I couldn't fit him in the narrative, so I'll just rattle him off. Should've been called the horse meat general. When he got out of the pool, he was general 12. This one just says dong hung dong. You get the point. But all great things must eventually come to an end. After suffering a series of defeats at the hands of his enemies and a subsequent failed rebellion against a quickly reunifying China, Zhang was forced to run away in 1928, bringing his mom with him to Beppu, Japan. His time here was relatively uneventful, except for when he shot a former prince in the back for trying it on with one of his concubines. In court, he said the gun just happened to go off while he was pointing it at the center of the guy's mass. For some reason, they're like, <laughs> nothing suspicious here, gave him the choice between 15 days in prison or a $150 fine. He chose the latter. Zhang's story finally came to an end in 1932, when he went back to Shandong, not as a conqueror, but as a visitor. Unfortunately, it seems it takes people more than four years to get over murder, because he was unceremoniously assassinated by the nephew of an officer that he had executed. All in all, Zhang left behind quite a strange legacy. Given the litany of horrible crimes that I've seemed to kind of gloss over, he's generally regarded as the stinkiest stain of an already messy portion of the tapestry that is Chinese history. The only remaining question is if one can truly separate the art from the artist. During his rule, Time Magazine described him as China's basest warlord. I'll let you decide whether or not they forgot the DE. That's all for today. Till next time, I'm Salmonella, and I'm hiding in your fridge.